Welcome to the Travel Agent Podcast. I'm your host, Aileen Blanco. I interview successful industry professionals and share my personal journey to becoming a travel agent. The show is for aspiring travel agents and travel professionals at every level. My mission is to uncover the universal keys to thrive in this business. Join me as I take a closer look into the life of a travel agent. Hello, and welcome to the Travel Agent Podcast. Today, I have a fabulous guest. I'm so super excited to learn all of the wonderfulness that he is going to give us today, and he is going to tell us a little bit about himself. Hi, this is Jeff Millar, and uh, I am very pleased to be here today. Uh, I have been in the travel business with my wife since uh, 2003, and uh my background has actually been in data processing, but with big Fortune 500 companies. I worked for companies like Boeing Computer Services, and uh, we came about and started our agency because in 2003, it was just after the airline stopped paying commission, and a lot of agencies really didn't know what to do with that because at that time, a lot of agencies, 60 to 70% of their income came from airline tickets. So they had to either fight that or decide how to restructure their business uh, to take advantage of the new world. Uh, at the time, my wife was managing two other agencies for an absentee owner. And I was kind of semi-retired, but thought I knew data processing. She knew the travel business. So what we were going to do is develop a company where we use the Internet as our marketing tool to attract customers, but actually work with them, not face-to-face, but over the phone, and make them feel as if they were sitting across the desk from us. Uh, so we weren't going to sell anything on the Internet because at that time, it was the same time that uh, the online companies started appearing. And uh, we knew we couldn't really compete with them, so we had to make ourselves look different than they did. So what we did was we put together websites, and we used all our advertising and marketing to drive traffic to our websites. And from the websites, we generated leads. And we spoke to people over the phone. And so one day I finished doing the website and I called my wife and said, okay, what do we do now? And she said, well, let's start it. So I turned on the switches and away we went and we haven't looked back since. And we built the business from uh, zero in 2003 to we now do over $5 million a year as a home-based agency. Awesome. Uh, we we have three employees and we have five independent contractors. Uh, so we're just a small operation working out of our home, but we've done a, uh, uh, a, a great job in just building up the business. Uh, actually, we've done more than a great job because we found ourselves working 10 hours a day, sometimes seven days a week when we started. And we kind of started it as a, as not as a hobby, but just as something to do. And it's grown into more than a full-time business. And what I hope to discuss today and talk to you about today is how we did that and some of the major points that you can use to go out and use those same ideas uh, to create your uh, agency and also grow your agency uh, to the point of, uh, of being very successful or as successful as you want. Uh, what I get a lot of questions from people and say, why do you want to share your information? Because aren't these people you're talking to your competitors? And my answer is we all, there's enough business for everybody. What we need to do is we need to help each other become as successful as we can, because if we don't, we're going to cease to exist as an industry. So I kind of, I'm on the back years of of looking at retirement, but the industry has been great to me. So what I'm doing now is looking at how can I give back to the industry to help the industry stay relevant and grow that industry. And so that's why I do things like this 
to basically give back to the aging community some tips that I've learned over the years, and uh, and hopefully they can incorporate that in their business to to make them successful. Well, I am incredibly grateful for to you to come on the show and giving us your years of experience um, and giving us some tips. So if you don't mind, could you start by kind of uh, telling us uh, your top like five tips? Uh, sure. My first number one tip and everybody that I do, it, I do a lot of training sessions. I do training sessions for Travel Weekly, Cruise World. Uh, I do some other organizations do training tips. And the first thing that I tell them, and I, we did this in 2003 when it wasn't popular, uh, but it really, really helped us be successful. And that's the area of specialization is I tell people, I don't care what you sell, but become an expert in something. Become known as the expert in something. It's going to help you in a lot of ways. And one of the ways it's going to help you out of your pocketbook is you can't be everything to everybody. So how can you now pay to advertise every product out there? You can't. So once you narrow it down to a particular product or even a couple of products that you specialize in, it's going to cut way down on your marketing costs because now you're only really promoting one or two products. And what we found is that will build the core of your business. A lot of your repeat clients will like to do other travel, which you can do for them. But what is building and continuing to this day after we've been in business 16 years, the core of our business are the two specialties we do. And so we started off in 2003, we started off doing nothing but all-inclusive resorts. That's all we did. If we got a lead for anything else, we turned it away. And we build the business up to about three to four million a year just doing all inclusive resorts, nothing else. And we also knew Hawaii, so we added Hawaii as a specialty. But I still consider us very specialized because we do not do anything other than those two markets, Hawaii and all inclusive resorts. But what we've done is we've developed our company so that we can offer other products to our clients. And we do that through bringing on ICs. And those ICs that we bring on have different areas of specialization than we do. So, for instance, we're doing all-inclusive in Hawaii and we get a lead for Europe. We have an IC that specializes in Europe. So what we do is that lead goes to the IC that specializes in Europe. So what we've done is we have broadened the number of products and the base of products we can sell, but still stay true to our specialization marketplace. So that's really, that's the number one thing that, that we have uh, found, and that's what made us successful probably more than anything else. The number two thing is realizing that when you're a travel agent, you are in sales. And I stress that simply because I have a good friend that was in the travel business. And 20 years ago, he stood up in a, in, in a session and his speech was on telling people, you are salespeople, even though you're travel agents. And he says, 20 years ago, when I first did that, half the people in the room got up and left because they didn't consider themselves salespeople. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you that you are, this is a sales job. That's what it is. If you don't know how to sell, if you don't like to sell, then it may not be the business for you because this is a sales job. So that's number two is realizing, coming to the realization that you're in a sales job. And in a sales job, you're going to have competition you have to deal with. You're going to have a whole lot of things you're doing that are sales related. They're not travel related which leads to number three in the points that we have learned that really helped us is, and I open every one of the training sessions I do with this statement is we do not sell travel. And people look at me like I'm nuts. Well, I'm a travel agent. Of course I sell travel. <laughs> and I say, no, you better not be selling travel. What we travel is a commodity. People can buy travel in hundreds and thousands of places. So travel is not a unique product. 
The unique product you have to sell is yourself, your knowledge, and your experience. Those are the unique products to sell. So now, and, and it, it's a subtle thing, but it really kind of changed our way of thinking is everything that we do now as far as advertising market is, is slanted towards telling people why they should work with us. Not necessarily that, that we, that we uh, uh, are going to provide travel. So what we do is we then, from the beginning of the sales cycle, is we sell ourselves, our experience, and our knowledge, and then we provide travel based on that. So if you listen to any of our sales calls when our agents answer the phone, what you would hear is probably the first 20 minutes, nothing about travel, but on why they should do business with us. Uh, once we do that, then we go into the process of talking to them about travel. But the first thing we do is we sell ourselves. Uh, if all you're going to do is sell travel, then what happens is you become a pricing source and that's it. Mm -hmm. You don't, there's, there's no, there's no engagement. There's no tie to that client because I'm going to guess sell you XYZ resort for this. And they're going to say, that's great. Now I can go on 50 other websites and price that resort and see, you know, what that resort is. And then I'm going to go, it'll, it'll always drive the decision to price. If that's what is, that's how you do it. So what we do is we sell ourselves, start the process of developing that relationship. And then we transfer into travel from that. But if you don't do it that way, you, like I said, you just become another pricing source and that's where you get the tire kickers, the people that are very on price and you waste time with all those people because you haven't developed a relationship or sold yourself first. And when we started, I would get calls and, and, uh, I would give somebody a quote and I'd follow up on that, on that quote. And the first thing they'd say when they'd answer the phone, oh, well, what agency are you from? And I'd hear them shuffling papers. And I asked one lady, I said, how many agents did you solicit a price from? And she said, well, I'm up to 15 right now. Wow. So people are out there. If you drive the decision to price, then guess what? That's what you're going to get. All they're going to do is they're going to go to 15 websites and price it to find the lowest price. Because there's no connection to you. There's no, you have not made yourself stand out in that, uh, in that method. And now that leads to the next point that I think is extremely helpful. And it's one of the major sales steps that most people forget about. And that is qualifying the client. And qual because I will tell you when a client calls you, they're qualifying you to see if you, they want to work with you. So your job is to qualify the client. And this is where I, where I see the, the problem of not qualifying is people say, well, I get all these people that call me and they want travel and I quote stuff and I put it out there. I either never hear from them again or they tell me the price is too high or, you know, they come up with some reason why they don't want to work. And I said, that's because you haven't qualified them. When we qualify a client, we go through, it's probably 15 steps in qualifying the client. And those steps will now tell us what does the client want? What are they looking for in their experience? Things like where have they traveled before? And people say, well, why is that important? And I said, have you ever gotten a call from somebody that says, I want a five-star resort and I want this luxurious resort and I only want to spend $3,000 for a week. And you say, well, that's nuts. You're not going to get a five-star resort. That question, when they make that statement to go there, is tell me a little bit about where you traveled before. Uh, what hotels and resorts have you stayed in before? Well, this person wants a five-star resort. In one case, came back and said, oh, whenever we travel, we stay in residence inn. And I said, Okay. So you stay and you like, oh, that's a great resort. It's great. It's a great hotel. It's fantastic. Well, it's not five star, but in their mind, it's five star. So you have to determine with that client, what is their definition of luxury and five star? We also learned that the two overused words in travel are deal and luxury. 
because they mean totally different things to every person. So you have to determine when they say luxury, if you, they say, I want a five star, I want a luxurious resort and I want to spend $3,000. A lot of people would say, okay, I'm not going to work with that person. When in fact, five star to them is staying in a resident gym. So now you can say, okay, if that's what you're looking for, I can understand that. And you can do that for $3,000 because you're not looking at the Ritz Carlton, which is what I consider five star. You're right. looking at a residence in, which I consider three star. So that's what you get out of that type of qualifying. The other and the most important one, and it's the one that people have the hardest time with, is how do I find out what their budget is? And I will tell you, we have learned at this point, we do not, we will not work with a client unless they tell us their budget. We absolutely won't. I mean, it's ridiculous. If they don't give us a budget, there's thousands of hotels out there. Am I supposed to price all thousand of them? Am I supposed to price this one, which is way high, and they fall in love with it, only to find out they can't afford it? So in the beginning, you need to find out what the budget is. And there's a way to do it. And it gets back to that old saying, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Because a lot of people say, well, if I give you my budget, you're only going to sell me the highest prices that's on my budget. So the way we approach it is, uh, and, and let's go back to that example of the person with the residence in. They say, residence, okay, so if we, we can find your budget's $3,000, uh, let's look at this from a value perspective, not a cost perspective, because what we're going to do is we are going to give you three or four resorts to look at. And that's the other thing is when you send somebody a proposal, don't load it up with 10 resorts, load it up with three, but two or three or four resorts. Now, once we decide, and that's the other thing, when you're talking to a client, Make it a collaborative effort. Don't say once you decide what resort you want, once we decide which resort is the best resort for you, now we're going to go out and find the lowest price for it. So that's very, is make that a collaborative effort. The we decide, not you decide. And also when you're doing the budget, we do, uh, what we do is we don't say, come out and say, what's your budget? Again, it's how you say it. What we say is, what number do you know, not want to exceed when you're going on this vacation? How many dollars? We have, we have one, she's a, a, a younger person, and she does it in a way I cringe, but it works for her. She says, I'm going to go out and spend your money. How much money do I have to spend? And it works because it's not blasting them in the face with what's your budget. So it's really how you say it, not what you say. You're asking the same question. You're just asking it in a much nicer way. And I would say 99.5% of the time, we'll get a budget for them. And then we have another trick that we use as far as that is people you'll get, and everybody's had these calls where you're getting to say, well, I don't, you know, I just want a deal. I don't know what the budget is, because I don't want to cost, but I just want a deal. And we say, okay, that's fine. You want a deal? I got a great deal for you. And they say, oh, what is it? I said, well, there's one for $20,000. And they'll say, oh, my God, I don't want to spend $20,000. And I say, they say, why is that a deal? And I said, well, because it's normally $25,000 but I can sell it to you for 20000 Oh, we don't want to spend that. So then we'll say, okay, same thing with 15000 We go through then 10000 Then we get to 5000 and say, I've got a great deal. It's normally about 8000 and get it for you for 5000 for everything you want. And they'll say, that sounds great. I think I, I can afford that. That's good. What you've done is you've just established their budget, even though they told you they didn't have a budget. So there's a way to get that budget. It's what you say. So that's that's just a piece of it. I do actually. I'm doing next week a webinar on how to qualify and educate potential clients. But so that's a whole different piece. But we found that the qualification step eliminates most of the tire kickers. It eliminates the people that you just don't want to deal with. And there's a lot of steps in that qualification process where you can discontinue working with that client in a nice way without upsetting them. So you have the choice to do that. But keep in mind, that client is also qualifying you as if when you're going to fall. Right. 
So that's, that is probably the number one step in the sales cycle. And if you do everything in the qualification and do every sales cycle, people say, well, I'm always uncomfortable asking for the order. If you've done everything in the sales cycle step by step, the next logical question is, okay, are you ready to purchase this? And there's a, there's a, it's called a, a, it's, it's, it's a qualifying close. It's not a real close. You can ask during these steps. And that is, I we ask you right up front, if I can find you a resort that fits what you're looking for and is within your budget, are you prepared to move ahead with purchasing this? And that's a, what that is, that is a, a trial close, it's called. And what it does, they'll either say yes, or they'll come up with a whole bunch of reasons why they're not ready to. Well, what has that done? It's now giving you a menu of all the items you have to address before they will be ready to. So either way, and you go into a trial close not expecting them to say yes, but expecting you to give you a whole bunch of reasons. But now you have a lot more information than you had before. And so you ask for the order. And another trick that we found in, in the business is we undersell things is we undersell and over deliver. So you can portray something as a four-star resort, and when they get there, they get a five-star experience, and now they're excited because, wow, you got me all this, and that, that, that. And so over, undersell, and over-deliver. So that's another big thing that we've, that we've learned in this business. The other thing we've learned is follow-up. Follow-up is critical in this. If you just, I will tell you 99% of the time, or maybe 80% of the time, if you're just sending out quotes and waiting for them to call you back and buy, it's never going to happen. It will never happen. Follow up with people, set a schedule. And what we do at the end of the, of the uh, qualifying and educating clients is tell people, set every step that you go through the way, Set the next step with the client. Okay, I'm going to send you some quotes, and then I'm going to give you two days or three days to review those, and then I'm going to give you a call back, and we're going to go over those resorts to narrow it down to one. And get agreement with the client. That would be fine. So always do that with every step. But also follow up. If you say you're going to follow up, then follow up. Uh, that is so, so that's critical. And that whole qualifying step is critical. Uh, I think the other, the other thing that we've learned and has really helped us is vendor relationships. Uh, so many people, I, I know a lot of agents who don't even know who their BDMs are for various resorts or various tour companies. We know we have the, we have three preferred suppliers we use. We do $5 million worth of business and we use three suppliers. And the reason is because if you now take all your business and you try to spread it over 20 suppliers, you're never going to get to any level with any one supplier. Where if you have three suppliers or one supplier or two suppliers, there's a lot, you can start building a very solid relationship with those suppliers and it's going to help you money wise because as everybody knows, your commission goes up the more you sell with the supplier. But if you're dealing with 20 suppliers, your commission will never go up with any one supplier. So keep your suppliers in a manageable number. One, two, three. I don't see any reason not to use. You can now, I'd say 10% of the time we do use suppliers other than our preferred suppliers, simply because they may not have what I'm looking for. But 80 to 90% of our business is done with our free preferred suppliers. We have a relationship with every one of those suppliers from the reservation person on the other end of the phone through the BDM, all the way up to the CEO of the company. Uh, I mean, we're good friends with the CEOs of every one of the suppliers. We're good friends with the BDMs. We're good friends with the vice president of sales of those suppliers. So develop a real, keep a manageable number of suppliers, 
develop relationships with those suppliers up the ladder. And it's helped us immensely. I mean, if you if you have an issue, and it may be from a regulation standpoint, kind of right on the line of whether you should or shouldn't do it, a lot of times that relationship will push that over the edge for you. And you'll get the supplier. Our suppliers, I mean, we do well over a million dollars with each one of our suppliers. So that basically puts us in a position. I don't do it because I respect the chain of command, but I could pick up a phone if I had an issue and I could call the president of the company or the CEO of the company, and he'd be willing to talk to me about it. But that's the kind of relationship you need with your suppliers. So I think supplier relationship is probably the second most important relationship you should have next to the client relationship. Uh, other than that, it's basically good service is the other thing. And that's where, that's where it falls as good service. Uh, follow up is a big, is an important thing. I have talked to clients who said, well, we called another agency and they said they'd call us back and we never heard from them. I had one that said, call, and they answered the way they answered. It was, well, I'm too busy. Call me back. That was the way they answered the phone. So, and that goes back to the beginning of the qualifying step, I say, is when you answer the phone, look at it. And a lot of times in sales training, they'll have a mirror right in front of them. So you can see, smile when you answer that phone. Be happy. I talk to suppliers, say, I go into an agency, and somebody will answer the phone, hello, what can I do for you? And it's like you're, the client is annoying them by calling. So it's a, it's a process that we found, but it leads back to selling. You've got to be able to sell and understand selling. And there's a lot of sales training courses you can take out there. Uh, don't be afraid to, to try things. Don't be afraid to call a customer. Don't be afraid to do those things. I will tell you that Selling is kind of like baseball. If you look at baseball and you look at a hitter hitting a baseball, if they hit the ball every time, that would be a batting average of a thousand. The average batting uh, the average batting average in baseball is two hundred and sixty. So that means out of every thousand times they're up at bat, they'll hit the ball two hundred and sixty times. So you're going to fail more than you're going to succeed when you do that. But if you follow those steps and the qualified steps especially, what you're going to see is you're dealing with more qualified clients, so your close rate's going to go up. So those are the major issues, things that we've found. Now, the other things, the new things coming into play in travel, one of them is fees. And that's, a, that's an issue that's been an issue for gosh, the last 10 years. Do I charge a fee? Do I don't charge a fee? And I can tell you from our experience, we charge fees on certain things and other things we don't charge fees on. If we're just doing a package to an all-inclusive resort, we don't charge a fee simply because we don't have to do any research. We know the product inside now. Once I talk to a client, qualify a client, go through all those steps, I already know which three or four resorts I'm going to recommend to them. I don't have to go do any research other than getting a price. So that we don't charge a fee for now, we just did someone that did a whole trip to Italy, and we did it even though it's not our specialty because they were good friends of ours. But that we charge a fee for because that takes a lot of work to put that together. So generally, if you're doing what I call FITs, and what's known as FITs in the industry, it's fine to charge a fee. If you're just doing package travel, I just don't know that you can be competitive if you charge fees during package travel. But it's something that you need to consider is do you charge a fee? Now, we do charge certain fees like we have a cancellation fee if somebody cancels. If they just want an airline ticket, which we don't do, I would say charge a fee to do an airline ticket. So there are certain things you charge fees for and certain things you don't. So fees, I think, are appropriate in certain situations. They may not be appropriate in other situations. So what is something that didn't necessarily, like a plan that didn't go well, um, that you may have kind of failed at, that you were able to kind of like bounce back from? Uh, I think in that area, it was really adding more specializations 
And I think where we failed is we failed to understand how competitive the market is, how, uh, how to structure it to sell that market. So we did a whole advertising campaign on a new market and it fell flat on its face. And we eventually became successful in it, but we had to go back and do the piece that we didn't do in the beginning, which was really do our research on that market. Is there a market out there? Who are the competitors? Who are the strong people in there? I mean, it, and I can tell you, it was one, it was back in the early days, it was one for doing escorted tours. Well, what we didn't realize is back then, every company that was selling escorted tours or agent would have an ad on Google or on the search engines discounting everything 30 and 40%. And it was very common to do that because back then people allowed discounting. Even now they still allow discounting. What they don't allow you to do is is advertise discounting. So you don't see it as much, but we weren't prepared to do that. So that whole market, I mean, we did a whole campaign, we did a website for it, everything. And the whole thing just fell flat on its face. So my thing is, whatever you're planning to do, make sure you do the upfront research to do this. I've, I've talked to agents who have said, oh, I got this whole new market and I love it because there's no competitors. And I said, be careful. That raises a red flag with me because if there's no competitors, is there really a market for it? So those are, those are the kind of, the, I, I guess the best thing is, is if you're going to do something, make a decision to do something, research it first and make sure that you have all your ducks in a row before you do that. And what it's going to do, it's going to, it's not going to say you won't fail, but it's going to increase your ability to be successful in that market. Another thing that you have to be very careful of is the service and how you say things to people, because one of the biggest things in the market today is reviews. And people are very quick, if they feel slighted by you, to write a bad review. Uh, and that is, we've found in our market research that when somebody, you need to have reviews on your website, that's definite. Because that is, especially the younger people, when they go to research a company, the first thing they'll look at is reviews. Before they even look at the, the rest of the information about the company, is they'll look at reviews. So you need to have reviews and understand that if you slight somebody or they feel like they're slighted, they're going to write a bad review. You get, you get, uh, what what is the rule? It's ten percent of the people that have a great time will give you a positive review. Fifty percent of the people that have a bad time will give you a, a negative review. So that's really critical, and that's an area that we had to learn through experience. I mean, we had one, and it wasn't with us; it was one of our ICs who really upset a client or a potential client. She went on every site on the internet she could find that we showed up and gave us a one-star review simply because he had upset her by something that he had said. And so that, that was something we had to learn was how do you manage reviews? And again, I think that the answer to that is it goes back to it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So that was one piece of advice I would give is, is when you answer a client and you're talking about maybe a touchy subject, remember it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You can, you can tell a client something negative in a very positive way. And that's what you, that's what you need to do. So that was something we had to learn the hard way also. And there was something that, that was kind of a failure that we, the, the, one, the only way I overcame it was I went to every website that I could possibly think of and just put an answer to her review. If somebody gives you a negative review, that's another good point. If somebody gives you a negative review, don't argue with them. Just put an answer to that, that they're sorry this, you're sorry this happened and none of that, and what you're going to do to correct it and what you're going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. But the worst thing you can do is argue with somebody that gives you a bad review. So, so does that answer your question? It definitely does. So since you've been in the industry since 2003, you've been through several of the changes. What are you most excited about the future in the travel industry? Uh, 
I think more, the thing that excites me the most is, first I want to say is changes, you're right. Is, and, the, and I tell people the only thing consistent in this industry and virtually every industry is change. So you're going to go through changes. You're going to go through ups and downs and changes. But I think the one that excites me the most is what you're seeing is more people coming to travel agents simply because they're overloaded with too much information. We get more and more people that will call us and say, look, I tried to do this from, by myself, and all I've done is totally confuse myself. And, and it's things like they'll go on and they'll price something and they'll go back an hour later and price the same thing and the price changes because the air may have changed. So the price changes and they don't understand that. They say, I've gone on four times today and I get a different price every time I go on. So it's things like that. And that's what excites me is that number one thing that excites me is that, that we're, I think more and more people are starting to use travel agents for that reason, if only to verify that they're making the right decision, but also to get rid of some of that confusion and become educated. A lot of people, especially a lot of people, I mean, I talked to somebody the other day that didn't real. they thought if a resort priced itself, that that price was good all year round. They didn't understand the different seasons, the high seasons, the low seasons, the Christmas seasons. They were totally clueless. They thought that that price was good whenever they bought. So they couldn't understand why you couldn't hide it, hide, why you couldn't hold that for them for six months because the price is never going to change. Well, yes, it will change. So I think that's the number one reason. The number two is I'm seeing a lot more younger people getting into the business. And I think it's giving the business a little different perspective uh, and how to do it. And even if you've never been in the travel business, that's not a bad thing. And there's a good example of that. I had a friend that uh, he and his partner went out and they bought three TGI Friday franchises. And they'd never been in the restaurant business in their life. And people told them, you're nuts. Why are you buying restaurant franchises? And you've never been in that business at all. And they said, and, and actually what happened in three years, they were the top TGI Fridays. And the reason was, the main reason they gave was they didn't come into that industry with any preconceived notions. They came into it with logically, this is the way things should be done. So we're going to do it the way they logically should be done. If you go and talk to somebody who's been operating, they'll tell you, oh, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So we didn't. We went in and said, logically, this is the way you run a restaurant. So they did it logically. And they became very successful. And I think that's what you're kind of seeing with a lot of the younger people is they're not coming in with preconceived notions or they're trying to come in and change some of the notions which, believe me, I think they, some of them need to be changed. I mean, some of the things that we do in this business, I shake my head. And I, I can't. Why would you do that that way? But that's just the procedure. And it's because we've done it that way for the last 20 years. And there's an analogy with that, too, is that uh, there was a little girl, and she was with her mother, and she was going to cook a ham. Now she got out the pan, she got out the ham, and she cut off the two ends of the ham, put the ham in the pan. And the little girl said, why do you cut the two ends off? She said, well, that's what my mother did. So they went to the mother and said, why do you cut the ends off the ham before you cook it? He said, well, because that's the way my mother did it. So they went to the grandmother and said, well, why did you cut the ends off the ham before you cooked it? She said, well, back then they made pans really small so the ham didn't fit in the pan. So we had to cut the ends off. It. So... It's that kind, and it's kind of that thing you'll see in this industry is if you talk to somebody that's been in the industry 30 years and talk to somebody that's been in the industry five years, you'll get two totally different opinions of this industry. And a lot of it has to do is, well, that's the way we do it. We've always done it that way, and we don't question it. So I think with some of the new people coming into the industry, you're going to get some new ideas. You're going to get some new ways of doing things. Uh the thing that scares me is a lot of people come into this industry that are not prepared from a financial standpoint. And that's what scares me is if you read the Harvard Business Review, the Harvard Business Review will say that uh, 
eighty percent of small businesses will all fail within eighteen months, and the main reason is undercapitalization. Because it takes about, and, and I can relate it to our business, it takes about three to five years to build your business up to a point where it's bringing in a consistent income in the travel business. Because, as you know, you're always selling stuff in the future. So to keep doing that and get it to a point where you have money coming in every month, it's about a three to five year process. And I don't know that a lot of people coming in understand that, so they're not totally financially prepared uh, to, to do that. So I think that's one concern is, I mean, I talked to a, a young agent that was starting their agency and I said, well, how much do you have allocated to, uh, advertising and marketing? He said, well, I don't have anything allocated to advertising. And marketing. I said, okay, how are you planning on getting clients? And he didn't know, which leads to another point that we need to do is Everybody, before they start a business, should sit down and do a business plan and a marketing plan. And the analogy to that is, if you lived in L.A. and wanted to drive to New York, would you just jump in your car and start driving? No, you'd plot out how you're going to get from L.A. to New York in your car. It's the same thing with a business. Your business plan is your roadmap on how am I going to get from here to here in my business. So you need to have a business plan that covers what business, what's your business philosophy, what is your business parameters, who's the competitors, how do you compete against these people, Uh, what is your marketing plan, what's your advertising plan, how are you going to do those, and that needs to be in place really almost before you open the doors, because now you're going to, you say, okay, I'm going to follow my business plan, and the other thing people, mistake people make is they do a business plan and they say, phew, that's done. And they stick it in the drawer and they never look at it again. A business plan needs to be a working document. You should pull that business plan out, I would say monthly, if not quarterly, and review it and say, okay, am I hitting my targets? In that business plan, you should set targets. Am I hitting my targets? Am I not hitting my What do I need to change? I anticipated this. Well, it went in a totally different direction. How do I need to change that to get back on track? So those are some of the things. That I, but I, I, I think it, it really excites me that we're getting younger and younger people. Like I said, I do a lot of training for Travel Weekly at Cruise World. And at Cruise World, every year, I see a whole crop of new agents coming in. Uh, there's some agencies that I'm very familiar with and all the people that own them that are owned by younger people. They're doing things a totally different way than agents did 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And the other thing that excites me about the industry is people sharing information. If you sat down at a dinner with 10 travel agents 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there would be silence at that table. Nobody would talk to each other. Because everybody looked at each other, each one of those other people as a, as a competitor. And they didn't want to give away any of their secrets. So you would sit there, and literally, I sat at dinner where you're looking, you know, you say hi to the person, how are you, fine. And that's the extent of the conversation, because they didn't want to share information. And I see that disappearing with uh, the younger generation coming in. I always get asked, last time I was a cruiser, I sat at the table and and the gentleman next to me was an agent, been in the business for 30, 40 years. I asked me, Jeff, why do you give away all your secrets? I, I don't understand it. These people are your competition. Why do you do that? And that's when I explained to him what I said in the beginning of this, uh, uh, of this session was because if I don't and we all don't do that, we're going to cease to exist as an industry if we don't share that information. So I think those are some of the things that I'm excited about. Also, a few of those things that I mentioned that I'm I'm kind of scared about is make sure you're prepared when you go into this business is what happens is people look at successful agents and they say, oh, they make it look so easy. I'm telling you, it is not easy. It is 24 hours a day. And if you're not working at it, you're thinking about it. So it's in the, for probably the first three years we started this business, we worked 10 hours a day, seven days a week. And we built the business. Now we're up to, we take 
half a day Saturday and Sunday off. Other than that, we still work 10 hours a day and a half a day on Saturday. So it, it takes a dedication and you've got to love what you're doing. That's really the key is you have to have a passion for what you're doing. And what's interesting is with my wife and I, she has more of a passion for the travel side. I have more of a passion for the business side. So between the two of us, we're a good fit. Uh, we both have a passion, but they're for different aspects of the business. So I guess that's, that's the thing that's making me excited, though, is I'm seeing more and more people sharing information and more and more people getting into the business, younger people, but they've got to have that dedication. If they don't, it's probably not going to go anywhere. And in five years, they're just going to give up and say, wow, you know, I thought I tried, but it didn't work out. And it, it, and it is harder than it looks. I will tell you that. There's no getting around that. It's that is the truth. <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I see people go through it every day. How do you do it? And I said, you, you make smart decisions. You educate yourself before you do things. That's the key. Understand what you're getting into. We had another business before this, and we sold it to a lady, and she actually came and said, I don't know how you did it. She said, you made it look so easy. <laughs> and I said, yeah, because you weren't there. It was a, it was a business selling ice cream at like convention centers and places like that. Well, what she didn't see was the three hours we were there early setting everything up, getting this done, getting this. All she saw was the big lines we had of people buying it. That's all she saw. And when she got into business, she didn't understand how much work it really was to do it. And I think there's a lot of that. And a lot of that is promoted by some of these companies that, that I consider not so much legitimate. They're kind of selling travel licenses and give, you know, pay me $500 and we'll make you a travel agent. Well, theoretically, you don't even have to pay $500. You go have a business card printed up and you're a travel agent. And that's part of the problem is there is no standardization like they and qualifications like you have for real estate agents in this business. So anybody can be a travel agent, but people that get in it find out that the business is a lot harder than it appears. So make sure you, I guess, make sure you understand what you're getting into before you do it. And if you're still committed to doing it, it just takes a lot of, it's a lot of hard work, but it should be enjoyable work. And it's working smart, not necessarily more or harder, but working, taking some of these tips, employing them in your business and working smart rather than harder. Thank you so much. You have given, I'm seriously have been writing notes um, as we've gone through this interview. Um, I have an entire paper filled uh, with everything that you gave me. So I really, really appreciate it. Uh, the audience appreciates you. Where can they find you? Where can they find me? The websites are, I use the old www.ultimate.com. All A L L dash inclusive travel.com and then www.ultimatehawaiivacations.com. And then our email address is ultimate travel 2003 at yahoo.com. Perfect. I will tell you that I will be doing training sessions at Cruise World in Fort Lauderdale in November. I will be there. <laughs> um, oh, well, yeah, okay. Yes, I am coming to Cruise World. Well, thank you so much. All of his information will be in the blog post and on the Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you again. This has been awesome. I am just really grateful and honored that you uh, chose to come on the Travel Agent Podcast and just, you know, give us all of your years of experience. So thank you again. And I look forward to um, just kind of following you and see all the wonderful things that you're doing. Anything that I can do for you and anything that I can do for any agents out there to help make them more successful, I'm definitely open to that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining the Travel Agent Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. 
Visit the travelagentpodcast.com for more information about today's episode and other travel agent resources. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for new episodes. Until next time, continue to build a travel business you love.